This is not the typical Java course. This Java course for beginners in 60 minutes will show you the fundamental concepts of Java. You can complete it in about an hour. This course comes complete with working examples and files. This course is intended for students with little to no prior programming or anyone who wants to understand basics of Java. It presents the information in an understandable format. Even if you have taken an Java course you will find the material insightful. The course introduces The fundamentals of Java Difference version of Java Features of Java Platform independent Java byte code JVM JDK JRE Java platforms Java development kit and Eclipse ID installation Variables Primitive data types, arithmetic operators, relational and logical operators, numerical comparison operators, the logical operators. Conditionals. If else, the switch statement. Loops. For, while. Arrays. Object-oriented programming. Objects, classes, encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction. Learning the fundamentals of Java puts a powerful and very useful tool at your fingertips. Java is running just about everywhere, Java is free, easy to learn, has excellent documentation, and is the base for all object-oriented programming languages. Jobs in Java development are plentiful, and being able to learn Java will give you a strong background to more easily pick up other object-oriented languages such as C++, Ruby, and Pascal. Let's start. Start with a brief introduction and history of Java. Since 1995, Java has changed our world and our expectations. Today, with technology such a part of our daily lives, we take it for granted that we can be connected and access applications and content anywhere, anytime. Because of Java, we expect digital devices to be smarter, more functional, and way more entertaining. In the early 90s, extending the power of network computing to the activities of everyday life was a radical vision. In 1991, a small group of Sun engineers called the Green Team believed that the next wave in computing was the union of digital consumer devices and computers. Led by James Gosling, the team worked around the clock and created the programming language that would revolutionize our world Java. Today, Java not only permeates the Internet, but also is the invisible force behind many of the applications and devices that power our day-to-day -day lives. From mobile phones to handheld devices, games, and navigation systems to e-business solutions, Java is everywhere. James Gosling is known as the father of Java because he created the original design of Java, implemented its original compiler and virtual machine. Listen his thoughts for students. Java as a language is actually pretty easy, uh, was, you know, compared to other languages. Um, you know, learning software development in general is a fairly daunting task. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's sort of around and above the language. Uh, Java is actually particularly easy and straightforward to teach as a first programming language. There are a lot of books about it. There are a lot of interesting tools. You know, there are things like, like the Blue Jay programming environment that comes along with a, with, with a textbook. It's really a great way to, to learn Java. And, you know, when I've watched people go through the, 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 the sort of learning Java process, um, you know, if, if there are people who have never done any programming before, it's actually pretty easy. You know, the, the, the hard nut for most people is, you know, understanding what object-oriented programming is all about. And it's pretty easy to explain object-oriented programming to people who've never programmed before because it's kind of like dealing with objects in the world around you. Um, but if people have already learned how to program COBOL, it's kind of strange. And they're, you know, in their head, they're trying to map COBOL on Java. And that can be hard. Um, but, you know, in general, it's pretty easy to learn. Let's go to review the different versions of Java. 
from the first version, released in 1996 to the latest version 8.0 released in 2014, the Java platform has been actively being developed for about nearly 20 years. Many changes and improvements have been made to the technology over the years. The following table summarizes all versions of Java from its early days to the latest. From the table above we can see that the naming and the version number have been changing over times. The version JDK 1.0 it was the first release of Java in 1996. The version JDK 1.1 is an improvement of the older version. Both versions 1.0 and 1.1 are named as Java Development Kit, JDK. From versions 1.2 to 1.5, the platform is named as Java to Standard Edition, J2SE. Version 1.5 and version 5.0 are just two different version names for the same version. Version Java S, E6, in this version Sun changed the name J2SE for Java S, E, and removed the point zero from the number of version. Version Java S, E7, took five years to be available after its predecessor Java S, E6. And three years for version Java S, E8 to be available to public afterward. The new version Java S, E9, will be available until 2016. Let's continue with the main Java features. They are also known as Java buzzwords. 1. Simple. Java was designed with a small number of language constructs, so that programmers could learn it quickly. It eliminates several language features available in C and C++ that are associated with poor programming, practices or rarely used, example of them are, go to statements, header files, structures, operator overloading, multiple inheritance and pointers. 2. Secure. Java is designed to be secure in a networked environment. The Java runtime environment uses a byte-to-code verification process to ensure that code loaded over the network does not violate Java security constraints. 3. Portable. The byte-to-code generated by Java can be used on any machine. 4. High performance. The use of byte-to-code makes the performance high. It was designed to support just-in-time compilers, which dynamically compile byte-to-codes to machine code. 5. Object-oriented. Java is a pure object-oriented. All programs and data reside inside our objects and classes. These objects have a unique identity, encapsulate attributes and operations, and are instances of classes, related by inheritance and polymorphism. 6. Robust. Java is designed to eliminate certain types of programming errors. Java is strongly typed, which allows extensive compile time error checking. It does not support memory pointers, which eliminates the possibility of overwriting memory and corrupting data. In addition, it's automatic memory management called garbage collection. 7. Multithreading. Means handling more than one job at a time. Java supports multithreading, supporting multiple threads of execution, including a set of synchronization primitives. This makes programming with threads much easier. 8. Dynamic language. Java supports dynamic loading of classes, so it is capable of linking dynamic new classes, methods and objects, also known as load on demand, dynamic compilation, and automatic memory management. In addition Java is designed to support various levels of network connectivity. Platform independent is the best feature of Java. Now in this section we are going to discuss how Java is a platform independent. Platform independent means writing codes in one operating system for example, Windows XP, and executing that code on another platform, for example, Linux, or Mac. Simplified Wara. That means write once, and run anywhere, this phenomenon is called platform independent. How Java becomes platform independent? This is due to the phenomenon called bytecode. Bytecode is the machine language of the Java virtual machine. By using bytecode execution Java proves it's a platform independent language. 
Let's go discuss the execution of Java Byte code. Now you're looking at the figure that explains the execution flow of the Java program. First write your source code in a plain text file and save it with .java extension using Java C compiler. The source code is compiled into .point class. The .point class file contains the source code in the form of Byte code. Byte code is a machine language of the Java Virtual Machine or JVM. Java interpreter and the JIT compiler are present inside JVM. JVM converts the bytecode.point class into executable code.pointobj with the help of interpreter or JIT compiler as needed. This .pointobj file is used to generate the output. Different types of JVM are available on different operating systems, such as the Sun JVM, the Microsoft JVM, and the IBM JVM etc. Using the JVM the same dot point class files can run on various platforms. This is the way Bytecode executes Java programs and proves that Java is a platform independent language. What is meant by JIT compiler? Let me tell you the JIT compiler is a compiler that converts program source code into native machine codes just before running the program. The JIT compiler is faster and more efficient to perform huge applications. On this section we'll see the Java terminology. First, what exactly is Java Virtual Machine, JVM? Java Virtual Machine is the heart of Java programming language. The Java Virtual Machine is a program for a particular hardware and software platform that runs Java technology applications. When we run a program Java, Java Virtual Machine is responsible to converting byte code to the machine-specific code. In other words Java Virtual Machine is a platform-independent execution environment that converts Java byte code into machine language and executes it. Java Virtual Machine is called virtual because it provides a interface that does not depend on the underlying operating system and machine hardware. Second. What exactly is Java Runtime Environment, JRE? The Java Runtime Environment, JRE, also known as Java Runtime, provides the minimum requirements for executing a Java application. It consists of the Java Virtual Machine, JVM, core classes, and supporting files. JRE doesn't contain any development tools like Java Compiler, Debugger, etc. Third. What exactly is Java Development Kit, JDK? Java Development Kit is the core component of Java environment and provides all the tools, executables, and binaries required to compile, debug, and execute a Java program. JDK is a platform-specific software and that's why we have separate installers for Windows, Mac and Unix systems. We can say that JDK is superset of JRE, since it contains JRE with Java compiler, debugger and core classes. Let's go to review the different platforms of Java. All Java platforms consist of a Java virtual machine, JVM, and an application programming interface, API. The API is a large collection of ready-made software components that provide many useful capabilities. This allows applications written for that platform to run on any compatible system with all the advantages of the Java programming language. The first platform is the Java Standard Edition, Java SE. Commonly is used for building desktop applications and applets. These applications typically serve only a small number of users at one time. This platform provides the core functionality of the Java programming language. It defines everything from the basic types and objects of the Java programming language to high level classes. This core functionality are used for networking, security, database access, graphical user interface, development, and XML parsing. The second platform is Java Enterprise Edition, Java EE, is tailored for more complex applications to suit medium to large businesses. Typically they will be server-based applications focusing on serving the needs of lots users at one time. Is built on top of the Java Standard Edition platform. 
The Java Enterprise Edition platform provides an API and runtime environment for developing and running large-scale, multi-tiered, scalable, reliable, and secure network applications. The third platform is Java Macro Edition, Java, Main. This platform provides an API and a small footprint virtual machine for running Java programming language applications on small devices, like mobile phones. The API is a subset of the Java Standard Edition, along with special class libraries useful for small device application development. Java Macro Edition applications are often clients of Java Enterprise Edition platform services. In this section you will download and install the tools needed for start programming in Java. All of these tools are free. 1. You will download and install the latest version of Java Development Kit, JDK, directly from Oracle website. 2. You will install 7-Zip. Is a tool that will allow you to decompress files of different formats like zip, ra, xip, and other formats. 3. You will download Eclipse. This is a platform that will allow you to create programs in Java easily. Let's start. First step. Go to Google and search for Java JDK. And open the link that says Oracle Java SE. On this page you will see different packages like JDK, JRE, Server JRE, etc. Just look for the link that says, JDK download, and gives click. Then you will need to accept the license. Then it showed us different versions of JDK for download. You need to select one according to your operative system, that could be Windows for 32 bits or 64 bits, also could be Linux, Mac, etc. You need to check which operative system you are using. In Windows 4 to check this, go to the computer, press right click, and select properties. Now you can see which operative system you are using. In my case it's Windows to 64 bits. According to this information proceed to download the JDK. Once you download the JDK proceed to install. Select it next in all the options. Now you have installed the latest version of JDK Java. Second step. Go to Google and search for 7-zip download. Gives click on download, 7-zip. On this page you can see different versions. Download the version according to your system. In my case is Windows 64 bits. Proceed to download, 7-zip for 64-bit Windows. Once the program is downloaded, proceed to install 7-zip. Select it next in all the options. Now you have installed 7-zip for decompress files. Third step. Go to Google and search for Eclipse Download. Open the link that says Eclipse Downloads. This page show you the different versions of Eclipse for download Windows, Linux, Mac. You can download the Eclipse Enterprise Edition, 32 bits or 64 bits according to your system. This version content the enterprise software for build web applications and general applications too. Or you can download Eclipse Standard Edition, 32 bits or 64 bits according to your system. This version just content library is for to build general applications on Java. I recommend you to download the Enterprise Edition for developers, that is very complete, and you can build your programs Java without problem. Proceed to download. Once downloaded the Eclipse application,
proceed to decompress it with 7-zip. You will see Eclipse folder. Cut this folder Eclipse. And put it in the directory that you want. I recommend to put in program files. Open the folder Eclipse and create a shortcut for Eclipse.exe. Cut this shortcut. And copy into the desktop. Now open this shortcut and select the workspace that appears for default. Now you have installed Eclipse Enterprise Edition with latest version of Java Development Kit, JDK, in your computer. Let's start to make our first program in Java. Open Eclipse with the shortcut that you created in the last video. Eclipse is asking us to create a workspace, select the default workspace, or create a new one on another route. Close this window. When you use Eclipse, you have to create a separate project for each program. Following these steps for make a new project. 1. From the file menu, select new, and then select project. The new project window appears. 2. In the new project window, select Java project. The new Java project window appears. 3. Type Java course in the project name field. I've chosen Java course for this example because these will include our first programs. 4. You can change a number of other options here. However, for our purposes, the default settings work just fine. You've created a project on Eclipse. Each project consists of the source code files you write for your program. For example, you might include images and files that contain settings to load at runtime and many other possible items. Now we are going to make a class. Every Java program has one class that is a program's starting point. Follow these steps for create the class. 1. Right click the course Java project in the Eclipse Package Explorer, choose New, and then choose Class. The new Java class window displays. 2. In the package field, type Chapter 1 point examples, or you can type whatever you like for the package, but remember to use a name that you can remember and keep it separate from your other projects. A package is a way to group classes together. In the name, type hello world. This is the name of your class. Remember that Java is case sensitive. Hello world is not the same as hello world. 3. Check the checkbox that gives you a main method, public static void main, string args. Click finish. 4. Now remove the comments in the class created. The comments in Java are represented by slash slash. Also are represented by slash asterisk and end with asterisk slash. For example I'm writing my first comment. The comments does not affect function of our programs. 5. Within the main method, type. System point out point print on hello world. This line is used to print text to the terminal or console. Not that the text has to be surrounded by the double quotes, in this case, hello world will be printed. All statements are terminated with a semicolon. 
all executable statements are contained within a method, in this case named main. Classes and methods are always defined in blocks of code enclosed by curly braces. Also there is an generally accepted naming convention in the Java community, to capitalize the names of Java classes and use the so-called camel case, or camel hump, notation, where the first letter of each word is capitalized, but the words are joined together. The string, args part, is the mechanism, that a Java program uses to read in options, more properly called arguments, that you can give to your program. That's a complete Java program. You can now run your program, by clicking the run button in the toolbar, or by choosing run as application from the run menu. Eclipse then displays a console panel under the code area, that shows the output of your program. In this case, it says, hello, world. Now you have a working program, let's make it do more. Specifically, let's make it read in your name, and say hello to you, rather than to the whole world. Look at the declaration for the main method. The args array holds all the values, that were provided to the Java runtime engine when someone started your program. We'll get the arguments from Eclipse. First, we need to write the code to read the arguments, and put the first argument into our message. The line system point out point print on. Just accepts a single string object as its argument. In this case, we've got three string, but the plus signs, concatenate them together to create a single string, satisfying the requirement, for just one string, of the print on method. For to provide a value argument in Eclipse, follow these steps. One with the mouse right click. From the Run menu, choose Run Configurations. The Run Configurations window appears. 2. In the Arguments tab, type your name. 3. Click the Run button. This time, your program says hello to you. Congratulations! At this point, you've created a program, that does the basic things. Accepts input, modifies the input to accomplish something, and produces output. In this video you learn what variables and data types are, and how Java uses them. Let's start. Follow these steps for create a new class. 1. Right click on the package, created chapter 1 point examples, choose new, and then choose class. The new Java class window displays. In the name, type example variables. This is the name of your new class. 2. Check the checkbox, that gives you a main method, public static void main, string args. Click finish. 3. Remove the comments in the class created. Declaring a variable is creating a variable, by specifying its name and data type. For example if you wanted to declare a variable that will be used to hold integers, you could do it by typing the following. In first number. This declares a variable of type and named first number. Note that the syntax for declaring a variable is the data type followed by the name of the variable. The variable first number becomes a container, that is able to hold integers. It does not contain any value, until it is assigned. You can also declare multiple variables on a single line, for example. In second number, answer. Now that you have declared your variables, you can assign the literals, by typing the following. First number equals 10. Second number equals 3. 
the variables are basically containers that hold specific types of data. Oddly enough, these specific types of data, such as integers, floating point numbers, and bytes, are called data types. The data contained by the variable can vary, that's why it's called a variable, but the data type cannot change. A variable's data type can be a reference data type, or a primitive data type. Let's review the primitive data types these are built into the system. They are not objects. They are specific values that can easily be stored by a computer using a specific amount of memory. There are eight primitive data types. They are listed in table. The four integer types, byte, short, int, and long, can be positive, negative, or zero. The same is true for the two floating point types, float and double. Floating point numbers, also known as real numbers, are used when evaluating expressions that require fractional precision. The char type can hold one Unicode character, for example, A, B, C, 7, asterisk. Unicode is a character set that provides a unique number for every character. The Boolean type can hold only the values true or false. After you have declared a variable to be of a certain type, it can only hold that specific type of data. The primitive data type you use depends upon what the purpose of the variable will be. For example, if you wanted to store highly precise scientific calculations, you would probably want to use a double. If you were using an integer to store the day of the month, the possible value should only be 1 to 31, so you could use a byte to minimize memory use. Also Java used the arithmetic operators in the same way that they are used in algebra. The following table lists the arithmetic operators. There are arithmetic operators for addition, subtraction, multiplication division, modulus, increment, and decrement. The modulus operation calculates the value of the remainder after a division operation. For example if you want to calculate 10 modulus 3, you can use the variable's first number and second number assigning the modulus result to the variable answer. This line of code calculates the modulus, and the result of this operation is stored in the answer variable. Now you can print the result to the console. And running this program the result is 1, because 10 divided by 3 leaves a remainder of 1. Review another example. Imagine that you want to write a program that calculates a 15% tip to give to your waiter or waitress after a nice meal. This line declares the variable meal and assigns it the initial value 22.50. Remember that the letter F specifies the literal 22.50F to be a float. On the next line, tip is declared to be a float, and is immediately assigned its intended value 15% of the cost of the meal. This mathematical operation multiplies the literal 15.0F by the value stored in the meal variable. The result of this operation is stored in the tip variable. The next line of code calculates the total cost of your dining experience by adding tip to meal and storing the result in total. After that, the application proceeds to issue messages to the user indicating the cost of the meal, the tip amount, and the result of its total meal cost calculation. And running this program we get the results. On this video you will learn if statements and boolean expressions. Let's start. Follow these steps for create a new class. 1. 
right click on the package, created chapter 1 point examples, choose new, and then choose class. The new Java class window displays. In the name, type example if. This is the name of your new class. 2. Check the checkbox, that gives you a main method, public static void main, string args. Click finish. 3. Remove the comment in the class created. The next program demonstrates the use of, if statement, and conditional statements. On this program we are going to identify the age of the user with two choices, if the user is 18 or is younger, or, if the user is older than that. Declare a variable user of type int, with the value for example 26. Then write the code. If keyword followed by a condition statement within parentheses. If user is less than or equal to 18 prints user is 18 or younger. The if keyword is followed by a condition statement within parentheses. The conditional statement is an expression that produces a true or false result. The conditional operators are used in conditional expressions to test for certain states of the operands. There are four numerical comparison operators, also called relational operators. These are used for comparing numerical data. The type of each of the operands must evaluate to a primitive numerical type, such as int, long, float, or double. The next table lists these operators. Note that in this table, both x and y can be any numerical data type. In the first operator the result is true, if x is less than y, otherwise, it is false. Second operator the result is true, if x is less than or equal to y, otherwise, it is false. Third operator the result is true, if x is greater than y, otherwise, it is false. Fourth operator the result is true, if x is greater than or equal to y, otherwise, it is false. Also you can use the equality operator, equals equals, to test for strict equality. This operation results in true only when the operands on either side are exactly equal. The result is true, if x and y are equal, otherwise, it is false. You can also test for inequality, by using the not equal to operator, not equals. This operation will return true, if the operands on either side, are not equal to each other. The result is true, if the values x and y are not equal, otherwise, it is false. The statements that execute, if the condition is true are placed within the braces. Recall that group of statements within a set of braces is collectively called a block statement. The braces are optional, if you need to execute only one statement. You can see the flow of a conditional statement, if the condition is true, otherwise the statement or statements are not executed, if the condition is false. Write another, if keyword followed by a condition statement within parentheses, for example. If user is greater than 18 prints user is older than 18. By running this program. Prints. User is older than 18. This is because the variable user contains the value 26, and is greater than 18. So in this case evaluates to true, and prints the message. User is older than 18. Now we review the, if else, this structure allows for execution of a conditional choice of two statements, executing one or the other but not both. The syntax is as follows. If the condition is true, the program executes the statements and prints user is 18 or younger. 
If the condition is false, the program executes the statements and prints user is older than 18. There can never exist a case where the program executes both statements. If you are using the else structure, you must place the else keyword directly after the corresponding if statement. By running this program, prints the message, user is older than 18, and is demonstrated how the if else statement works. Also in Java you are able to conditionally execute one of two statements, based on a single condition this is possible with the nested else if statement. For example you can add the next lines into our example. There are a couple of things to explain here. Here, we want to check if the user is older than 18, but younger than 40. Remember, we are trying to check what is inside of the user variable. The first condition is greater than 18. The second condition is less than 40. In between the two, we have our and operator. So the whole line says else if user is greater than 18 and user is less than 40. Here we are using the logical operator an. Review what exactly is this logical operator. In Java there are two logical operators. The logical operator, and, that returns true, if both arguments are true. And false, if either one is false. This logical operator is one of the most often used operators. And it's most often used with an if statements, but is handy anywhere, you need to be sure, that two boolean values are true. The logical, or, operator returns true, if either of its arguments are true and false. Only if both arguments are false returns false. These conditionals operators are used to form compound conditions by grouping conditions together. By running this program, you should be able to guess what it will print out before running it. Prints the message, user is older than 18 and less than 40. Because the conditions are true. Is demonstrated how the nested else if statement works. You can change the value of the variable user and test this program for yourself. On this video I'm going to explain how does work the sentence for on Java. Let's start. Follow these steps for create a new class. 1. Right click on the package, created chapter 1 point examples, choose new, and then choose class. The new Java class window displays. In the name, type example 4. This is the name of your new class. 2. Check the checkbox, that gives you a main method, public static void main, string args. Click finish. 3. Remove the comment and the class created. I'm going to start with a brief explanation. The for sentence is a repetition control structure that allows you to efficiently write a loop that needs to execute a specific number of times. The loop for is useful when you know how many times a task is to be repeated. The sentence for has four parts. The first part is the initialization is usually an assignment statement that sets the initial value of the loop, the control variable, which acts as a counter that controls the loop. The second part is the condition. This is a boolean expression that can be true or false, in other words determines whether or not the loop will repeat. The third part is the body sentence. If the condition is true, the body sentence runs once. The body is a series of statements. The four part is the iteration expression. 
This defines the amount by which the loop control variable will change each time the loop is repeated. Notice that these three major sections of the loop must be separated by semicolons. Let's review one example. This is a racer program to 10 laps. Where is sends a message when the competence is started? This program is sending a message for every lap that is finished with the number of lap and is sending to the console of Java another message when competence is concluded. I'm going to run this program to review the results in the console of Java. On this example the first message that is displayed is go. That correspond to this line of code. Then, the for loop is started. We used our variable of initialization. That is, lap equals 1. Then we create the condition. That means, as long as lap was less than or equal to 10, the loop continued to repeat. And is printed the body sentence. The first time prints. Completed one laps. Because a variable lap has the value 1. This is displayed in the console. Then the interaction starts with the increment of the variable lap adding 1. Now lap has a value of 2. Like the condition continue true. Is printed again the sentence, but now with a value 2. This is displayed in the console. Then is increment again the variable lap adding 1. And changes the value of the variable. Now lap has a value of 3. Like the condition continues true. Is printed again the sentence, but now with a value 3. On this way, continue executing the loop for, in repetitive way until the condition converts to false. This happens, when the lap has a value of 10, and is adding 1. Because the result is 11, and the condition is false now. So does no execute the body sentence. And is conclude the loop for. The next sentence, that execute is finish. We can see in the console. Check that this operator causes, that the variable lap, being incremented by 1. But also in Java you can write on this way. Lap equals lap plus 1. In Java this syntaxis is the same too, lap plus plus. Running the program has the same results. To be more specific, this operator, as it is used here, is called the postfix increment operator, because it is placed after the variable. You learned about the increment operator plus plus. As you know, this operator causes the operand to be incremented by 1. But what, if you wanted to skip values, while incrementing your variable in the loop? You can write a loop that counts increments of 5 like this. On this example, we used our variable of initialization. i equals 5. Then we create the condition. That means as long as i was less than or equal to 100, the loop continued to repeat by running this program. Is printed. 5 the first time. Because the variable i has the value 5, 
This is displayed in the console. Then the interaction starts with the increment of the variable, i, adding 5, and changes the value of the variable. Now, i, has the value of 10. Like the condition continues true. Is printed again the sentence, but now with the value 10. This is displayed in the console. Then is increment again the variable, i, adding 5 and changes the value of the variable now, i, has the value of 15. Like the condition continues true. Is printed again the sentence, but now with the value 15. On this way, continue executing the loop for, in repetitive way until the condition converts to false. This happens when the, i, has the value 100, and is adding 5. Because the result is 105 and the condition now is false. So does not execute the sentence. And is conclude the loop for. So far, every for loop, you've encountered counts forwards. But you can also write a for loop, in such a way that it counts backwards. Using the operand, minus minus, that means minus 1. Review another example to demonstrate the use of this operand. On this example, we used our variable of initialization. t equals 10. This value will contains during the first iteration of the loop. Then the condition. Means that this loop to terminate when t reaches 0. Running this example. The first time t is printed with the value 10. Because the condition is true. This is displayed in the console. Then the interaction starts decrement, t, by 1. Like the condition continues true. Now, t, has the value of 9. This is displayed in the console. On this way, continue executing the loop for, in repetitive way until the condition converts to false. This happens when, t, reaches 0. So does no execute the body sentence. And is conclude the loop for. On this way the loop for, works in Java. On this video I'm going to explain, how does work the loop while, and do while, on Java. Let's start. Follow these steps for create a new class. 1. Right click on the package, created chapter 1 point examples, choose new, and then choose class. The new Java class window displays. In the name, type example while. This is the name of your new class. 2. Check the checkbox, that gives you a main method. Public static void main, string args. Click finish. 3. Remove the comment in the class created. In my last video you use the for loop, when you know how many times you need to loop, or are counting something. On this case the while loop, is used when you don't know, how many times you need to loop. The while has the next structure. Has a condition within parentheses that evaluates to either true or false. Also contain a block statement that are execute each time the loop iterates and the loop terminates once the condition evaluates to false. If the condition is initially false, the loop statements are not executed. Let's review an example. On this example, shows the typical structure of a while loop. Is declare a variable. 
Then the while loop starts, and check if the condition is true or false. If the condition is true execute the body sentence. If the condition is false, the while loop is done. Running this example. We have these results in the console. Because the variable number is declared with the value 1. Then the loop while starts and checks if the condition is true or false. On this case the condition is true because number has the value 1. So, execute the body sentence, printing the message in the console with the value 1. Then increment the variable number, adding 1. Then go back and check the condition again if it's true. On this case the condition continues true because variable number has the value 2. So, execute the body sentence again and print the message in the console with the value 2. Then increment the variable number again adding 1. On this way the loop continue until the condition is false. On this case it's false when the variable number has the value 11. So does not execute the sentence and the while loop is done. Also in Java exists do while loop. The difference between while loop and do while loop is that the statements of the loop come before the condition, so no matter what, the loop will iterate at least once. This is the syntaxis. The control of the code first enters the do block statement and executes them. After that, the code looks at the while condition. As long as the condition is not false, the statements in the do block statement will repeatedly execute. Watch the condition. Comes at the bottom of the loop, rather than at the top. Let's review an example. Here's a loop that counts from 1 to 20. On this example, shows the typical structure of a do while loop. Is declare a variable. Then the while loop starts and execute the body sentence, no matter what, the loop iterate once. Then check if the condition is true or false. If the condition is true execute the body sentence again. If the condition is false, the do while loop is done. Running this example. We have the next results because the variable number is declared with the value 1. Then the loop do while starts. And first thing that execute is the body sentence, printing the message in the console with the value 1. Then increment the variable number, adding 1. Then checks if the condition is true or false. On this case the condition is true because the variable number has the value 2. So, execute the body sentence again, printing the message in the console with the value 2. Then increment the variable number, adding 1. Then checks the condition again. On this case the condition continues true because variable number has the value 3. This loop continue until the condition is false. On this case it's false when the variable number has the value 21. So does not execute the sentence and do while loop is done. On this way the loop while and do while works in Java. On this video we are going to review a new statement called switch. 
Let's start with the theory. The switch provides for a multi-way branch. Thus, it enables a program to select among several alternatives. Provides an easy way to dispatch execution to different parts of your code based on the value of an expression. As such, it often provides a better alternative than a large series of if-else if statements. One difference between if statements and switch blocks is that if statements must always resolve to true or false, and the switch statement for many situations is more efficient approach. Here is the general form of a switch statement. The value of the expression is compared with each of the values in the case statements. If a match is found, the code sequence following that case statement is executed. The break statement is used inside the switch to terminate a statement sequence. This has the effect of jumping out of the switch. The break statement is optional. If you omit the break, execution will continue on into the next case. If none of the constants matches the value of the expression, then the default statement is executed. However, the default statement is optional too. If no case matches, and no default is present, then no further action is taken. Duplicate case values are not allowed. The type of each value must be compatible with the type of expression. Let's review an example. Follow these steps for create a new class. 1. Right click on the package, created chapter 1 point examples, choose new, and then choose class. The new Java class window displays. In the name, type example switch. This is the name of your new class. 2. Check the checkbox, that gives you a main method, public static void main, string args. Click finish. 3. Remove the comment in the class created. On this example the switch statement will check the user variable and see what's in it. It will then go through each of the case statements. When it finds one that matches, it will stop and execute the code for that case. Then, it will break out of the switch statement. If none of the values matches, then the default statement is executed. Running this program. The result in the console is your 20. Because the first thing that the code does is to set a value to user in 20. Then, the switch statement check the user variable and see what's in it. For the first case it not finds the value. For the second case it not finds the value. For the third case it finds. So it stop and execute the code for that case. Prints, your 20. Then break out of the switch statement and the switch statement is concluded. Changing the value of the user to 26 and running the program. The result in the console is you're not 18, 19, or 20. This is because the default keyword, which is optional, is used to define statements that execute if the expression doesn't equal any of the case values. For versions of Java prior to JDK 7, the switch statement expression must be of type byte, short, int, char, or an enumeration. And in the versions beginning with JDK 7, expression can also be of type string. Let's review an example. On this example, is declared an variable to type string, with the name beach, and with the value, Newport. 
This string will be tested against the case constants. When a match is found, the code sequence associated with that sequence is executed. Running this program. The result in the console is User wants to visit Newport Beach. Because correspond with this case statement. Then, break out of the switch statement. And the switch statement is concluded. Remember that the type of each value must be compatible with the type of expression. Each value specified in the case statements must be a unique constant expression. It means that duplicate case values are not allowed. That is the way that works the switch statement in Java. On this video, you will learn how does work the arrays in Java. Let's start with the definition of the array. An array is a data structure that holds a group of variables under a single identifier. Java supports arrays for both primitives and objects. For example here is declaring some arrays. Check when declaring an array, you need to specify the data type that the array will maintain in its list. Also you need to give it a variable name and specify it as being an array by using square brackets. After you declare an array variable, you need to assign an array object to it before you can start using it. For example, check that the array is using the new keyword like you do when creating any new object. You have to specify the array length, which is its size, or more specifically, the number of items it can hold, in other words its capacity. After these array objects are created, count numbers is an array able to hold 10 integers. Item prices is an array able to hold 18 doubles. Object list is an array able to hold 3 objects. And answers is an array able to hold 100 booleans. After that you can assign values to the array element. For example, in the array count numbers, you can assign element on this way. Note that the first line assigns 1 to the first element. The first element of an array is always indexed by 0. Also note that the last element of this array is equal to 9. Less than the array's total length, because the subscripts or array index start at 0, not at 1. The array element are individual values stored under specific subscripts of the array. The array subscripts are integers that represent an item's position within the array also called an array index. In Java you can also declare an array, assign an array object, and assign values to the array's element on one line. For example the following line declares an array of strings, called seasons. Using braces, and specifying the element's values, in order, separated by commas initializes the element of the array. The length of seasons array is 4, because it is initialized using 4 strings. On this array, seasons, 0, is winter, seasons, 1, is spring, seasons, 2, is summer and seasons, 3, is autumn. Also you can access to the element that are already stored in the array by using its array index. For example on this line of code is access into the element 0. Printing. This season is winter. Let's review an example. Follow these steps for create a new class. 1. Right click on the package. Created chapter 1 point examples, choose new, and then choose class. The new Java class window displays. 
in the name. Type example array. This is the name of your new class. 2. Check the checkbox. That gives you a main method. Public static void main string args. Click finish. 3. Remove the comment in the class created. On the next example. Is define and string array named grocery items with five element. This array is created in one step. Then on this line prints the third element of the string array. Then with these lines prints the size of the array. And then iterate all the element of the array. Printing the values. Running the program. We have the results in the console. The third element in the array is avocados that correspond with the array index 2. The size of array is 5 which corresponds to the number of items in the array. And finally is printed the element in the order that contains the array. Let's review another example. The following program finds the minimum and maximum values stored in the nums array. In the first lines are declared an array with 10 element and the variables minimum and maximum. Then are assigned the element to the array randomly. Then on this line is assigned the minimum and maximum values that is equals to the first element in the array. Then is used a for loop by cycling through the array. Inside of the for loop are used to if sentence. In the first if sentence asks if the value that correspond in the array is less than the current minimum value. If is less, then is assigned a new minimum value. In the second if sentence, asks if the value that correspond in the array is higher than the current maximum value. If is higher, then is assigned a new maximum value. Then on this lines are printed the minimum and maximum values. Running the program. We have in the console the minimum and maximum values that are contained in the array nums. This is the most commonly used array in programming. On this video you will learn object oriented programming. Because Java uses these principles for design applications and computer programs. Object oriented programming is a programming paradigm that uses objects to design applications and computer programs is based in the next principles objects classes encapsulation inheritance polymorphism abstraction all these seem like intimidating words but are really fairly simple concepts to comprehend so let's have a look at our first main principle of object-oriented programming. What is an object? An object is an unique identity which contains data and functions, state and behavior. Look around right now and you'll find many examples of real-world objects. Your dog, your desk, your television, your bicycle, your car, etc. For example, this car has in state, color, shape, engine, speed, etc. And has a behavior too. Starts, accelerated, braked, etc. They consist of state and behavior. An object stores its state in fields that commonly says variables or attributes. 
and exposes its behavior through functions that commonly says methods. What is a class? A class is the blueprint from which individual objects are created. For example, this is the class car that create car objects with his own state and common behavior. What is encapsulation? Encapsulation means wrapping up data and member function together into a single unit class. Encapsulation automatically achieve the concept of data hiding providing security to data by making the variable as private and expose the property to access the private data which would be public. This model represent this concept. Internally there are methods and variables as private that only the class know. And also there are methods and variables publics that help us to manipulate the class from outside. An example of encapsulation is your television is made internally by circuits, chips, LEDs, etc. This is the box where are stuck all these components of encapsulated form. And you can manipulate this components of the TV externally by remote control, smartphone, PC, etc. Similarly in object-oriented programming, we encapsulate the data and methods inside of the class. To keep it safe and accessible only to authorized members. What is inheritance? In simple words, inheritance is a way to define newer class, using classes which have already been defined. In other words inheritance is the capability of a class, to use the properties and methods of another class, while adding its own functionality. For example on this representation. Ford car, Audi car, and Volkswagen car are subclasses from class car. These subclasses automatically takes on all the behavior and attributes of its superclass car. In the Java programming language, each class is allowed to have one direct superclass, and each superclass has the potential for an unlimited number of subclasses. What is polymorphism? Polymorphism is the process of using a function for more than one purpose. For example, here we have a function called speak and is used for more than one purpose. What is abstraction? Abstraction is the concept of exposing only the required essential characteristics and behavior with respect to a context. For example when we see a nice car on the road as a casual onlooker, we get to see the whole picture. The car is a one single unit, a vehicle. We do not see the underlying complex mechanical engineering. But now consider we are going to a showroom to buy a car. What do we see now? We see four wheels, powerful engine, power steering etc. We see the car at higher level components. But, there is so much inside it which gives a completeness to the car. Now consider a mechanic, who is going to service the car. He will see one more level deeper with more level of information. When we design software, we take the context. On this example, we ask the question whether we are designing the software for a causal onlooker, or for a buyer, or for a mechanic. Levels of abstraction is applied on the design accordingly. All of these concepts are the main principles of object-oriented programming. See you in the next video. Bye.